Okay, we are live. Uh, see some people waiting. So if you want to join in, this is a little bit of an experiment here. And uh, basically the idea is this is a pre-flask show while Caleb is finishing up his live stream for the day. Uh, I hop on a little bit early and answer just general questions about production and things that you might be interested in. So if anybody wants to jump into the chat at this time, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Uh, it's a little bit of an experiment. We're going to see if this works out, if it's going to be something that I do on a weekly basis or not. But as I said, if you have some general questions about... Uh, there you go. Somebody's in. Hey, show a close-up of a mini Matthews grip head attached onto a light stand. Um, how well does it fit onto a baby pin? Yeah, okay, good. So that's the kind of stuff that we're gonna be doing. So first of all, uh, just a little housekeeping. My name is Jem Schofield with the C47. I'm assuming if you're here, you might know that. Uh, this is the pre-live stream live stream, but it's all just gonna keep going. And I'm also doing another experiment, which is with my weekly episodes, which drop at noon Eastern every Wednesday. I'm doing this thing called Premiere, uh, and you basically schedule a Premiere, and then I show up when the video goes live, and then you guys get to watch it with me and ask questions about the episode. I don't know if I'll keep doing it, but I'm trying it out. Okay, so angles and acid. Uh, the question has to do with, and where the, where the, are they? Okay, I think I can make this work here. So let's, uh, everybody can see the question in the chat. So we've got the mini, the mini grip head here from Matthews. And um, so this is a, so this just to answer your question, it just goes on to a, a regular baby pin. Okay, so there it is. And I will grab something here because it happens to be the grip, part one of the grip episodes. And I'm seeing reviews of the minis not fitting on baby pins. Uh, not a problem. I mean, they are loose here. That's the mini grip head. Uh, there's no baby pin that I've tried to put them on that they don't fit on, uh, unless it's some sort of non-standard C-stand. Uh, I don't know. Uh, are they talking about this part right here? If you're talking about attaching it directly to the stand, it is not a problem for a regular baby pin, 5.8 stud. Uh, if it has to do with this, the openings are not quite as large as on a standard knuckle, so you are not going to necessarily be able to get things that you would always put into a standard knuckle into these. So I hope that answers the question. Okay. So we are doing it. Uh, what else we got? We've got other people watching. This is general production questions related to cameras, lenses, lighting, uh, grip, electric. We're not talking about drinks yet. That happens when the episode starts in about 10 minutes. So what else do we have? Um, I'm waiting here for questions. And that's kind of the idea of the pre-flask show and this test. And uh, yeah, they were probably talking about the teeth part for the mini grip head. I just wanted to make sure before buying. Yeah, I mean, when you're grabbing onto things, if you take a, a standard knuckle here, you can see that the opening here is considerably larger than the mini grip head. Um, there are openings that are similar or the same as the mini grip head as well, but you just don't have that larger opening on the mini grip head. I own tons of those mini grip heads, so they are absolutely fantastic. And it's just... Uh, Horses for courses. So you use what you need on the jobs that you are doing. Uh, let me know if you guys like the idea of the pre-flask show and if it makes sense for us to do this every week. Uh, if my schedule permits, I will try to do that. And again, I just mentioned uh, at the beginning, at the top of this pre-show, the, uh, hey Harrison, thanks. I enjoyed designing that book light from Westcott. It was uh, quite a journey, about a year, year and a half to do that. And um, the big thing was figuring out the swing hinge and how that was going to work. Early prototypes were with the uh, original version of, of Scrim Jim. And then we designed that swing hinge and that's where 
uh, it all started to come together. So angles and acid. Another question. If I want to shoot a night exterior scene of people in a car, is there a practical difference between doing a bounce or a shoot through diffusion uh, space in sex? Well, um, it, you know, it has a lot to do with what that uh, fabric is, you know, what you're using to bounce or to diffuse through. Um, you know, you tend to get a slightly more um, directional beam when you are going through diffusion than when you are bouncing off of something. So you have to see and think about what you're trying to recreate. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with the material. So if you're going off of, uh, you know, something heavier than, you know, uh, bounce off of white fabric or half silent grid cloth, as in bounce off of white fabric or diffuse through half silent grid cloth, uh, very different depending on that white fabric and how many stops uh, it is actually cutting and that kind of stuff. Mm, I mean, it depends what you're trying to recreate. If you're trying to recreate something like a street lamp that would tend to read as a harder source coming into a car, um, so would the moon if it was not being diffused by clouds. Um, if you want it to feel like a more diffused light, then you could definitely bounce as your first step. Um, you know, the best thing to do in that type of situation is to have two frames uh, or have the basically the rags for a single frame and just audition them uh, quickly. Or if you've got a couple of crew there, you can just Hollywood that thing and push a light through it and then uh, just go and bounce a light off of it. But again, if you're bouncing, you'll tend to have a little more scatter generally than if you're going directly through and diffusing through something. Um, So you're not worried about the softness look, just wondering if one is easier to do than the other. Um, a lot of that is logistics based on the space that you have. Um, you know, if you think about it, if you have a fixture that is between the car and your, your, your rag, then that could be technically more problematic than if you have the fixture above and going through the rag. Uh, you have a little bit more freedom if you are diffusing as opposed to bouncing in that type of scenario. And I would tend to, um, I would tend to, in most situations for a car interior, think that that light is coming from either above or from the side. So I would tend to go through something there, and um, and that would make sense to me. Um, hmm. So hopefully that helps. Let me see. Rimrock Creative Media have both the Westcott DP kit and booklet kit. I usually have to use two C stands and the Westcott vice grips to hold a four by four diffusion. Any suggestions for portable use to work with one C stand? Well, it depends obviously on the uh, on the the angle of the four by four, right? So if I, there are a lot of situations where if I bag a C stand with a lot of dirt that I can use one single Mathalini clamp with that four by four. And I've done that actually many times. It gets a little, uh, it gets a little tricky sometimes when you are outside, of course, um, because these things just become big wind sails. But, uh, you know, a, a really good, you know, uh, knuckle on a C-stand with a real Mathalini or Cardellini clamp should do the trick in most situations. Uh, again, it's an angle thing. So there you go. Two beer in. This is going to be a good show. All right, Harrison. Uh, you know, we don't judge here. We're happy to have you. And whatever you guys are drinking, that's uh, good to go. Now, uh, there are going to be times when you're going to need a couple of grips there. The vice grips from Westcott, they're okay. They are not Cardellini or Mathalini clamps. So I would just say, you know, you if you have not invested in the real deal here, you're going to want to have some of those things, and uh, away we go. So what else we got? Uh, Acrylic HD. 
Thanks for coming over from Caleb's. He is probably 10-1 uh, right now and trying to find his drink so he can head on over to the broadcast. Um, what's up, 360 grad? Um, we've got some people showing up here. Fort Collins, Colorado in the house. Uh, and then, hey, Robin, nice to see you. And... Caleb just finished. Yep, he's doing his thing. I know what he does. He's got to go pee-pee, and he's got to go get a drink. Uh, you can't drink more unless you go pee-pee. What's up, Memo? Uh, could someone please address the weird thing called the Frank, <laughs> Frank, and Frank 8K camera and the dude who created it? I need a therapy talk about that. I need a link to that, Loom. You got to let me know about that. You missed some streams. Was in Japan for a month. I am jealous. That is an amazing place. One of my favorite, um, the Gentleman Club. Yeah, well, we're here. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have Mr. Ben Barden. He is up in uh, the North Pole hanging out with Santa Claus and some elves and maybe a narwhal or two on an oil rig. So there you go. Uh, what's a good upgrade for the T3i for vlogging and studio? I'm willing to spend up to $1,200. All right, Krilly HD. That's a good question. Um, you're going to probably get different answers from different people. Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Whew, that is a tough one. Eee. I mean, I still think that the M50 from Canon is a heck of a deal. There are some definite downsides to that, but you've got dual pixel CMOS AF. You've got a camera with a lens that's going for $599 US lets you invest in some other stuff. It's definitely an upgrade from the T3i. Uh, I think if you start upgrading from there, we want to take a look at the X-T3, just a little bit above that in terms of price. Um, obviously, the GH5 series is another way to go, but then you're in micro four thirds. Uh, that's not necessarily, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but yeah, there you go. So 360 grad, it's getting cold up here in Oregon. Uh, and we don't have all the insulation here in the barn yet, so I might have a space heater down here keeping me warm. Um, so let's see what else we got. Hello from Australia. What's up, Jason? Orlando's here. Um, build a starter grip kit. Well, we're going to talk about that, Orlando, uh, to a certain degree in this episode, and then we can follow up on that. What is stopping Canon from releasing a 4K60 firmware update? Is it the components that are limiting this firmware update, I have no idea now. I have just stopped guessing. Um, we know that part of it is about, oh, this is about reference to the C300 Mark II. Yes, I actually do think that it is a hardware issue for that. That camera is over four years old. Some of the newer cameras I scratch my head about in terms of that stuff. Um, but for the C300 Mark II, that is definitely an older processor and stuff, and really, I don't think they can do it. I have had many conversations with people, trust me, about that. Um, 90D, they're going to come out. I don't know. I don't know really what uh, Canon's roadmap is going to be for their DSLRs. I think that we are going to see more in that form factor, but they're definitely going down the mirrorless route, which I think is a good thing all around. They've committed to a new lens mount, uh, R mount, which means, uh, you know, they're going in. Yeah, uh, M50 is pretty lit. Um, you know, the, the disadvantage to that is there are few and far between in terms of lenses, but it is very adaptable to any Canon EF or EFS lens. And, uh, you know, you pop a 10 to 18 on there with a lens adapter and Bob's your uncle. So for $599, you get the 15 to 45, you get the camera. It's got dual pixel. It has a flip out screen. Um, it's pretty cool. C100 Mark II in today's market. Fantastical HD camera. That's my answer to that. But for not a tremendous, well, at this point, I guess you can buy a couple of those. I tell you what the real deal is, is a C100 Mark I which they were doing for $15.99 uh, at B&H over the Black Friday week sale. It's uh, still only $19.99. So if you want an HD camera, your biggest downside on there is not the picture that it produces, but the lack of dual pixel CMOS AF. Um, don't know much about the Sony VG30. 
so I'd have to look into that, but maybe I'll look into that and then give you some idea. Um, use some of your setup advices in Japan. Awesome, 360 grad. Uh, howdy from Atlanta, Baron. Nice to have you here. And what else we got? Anything else? Oh, here he is. Uh, the golden child. Oh, Sorry. my goodness. It's oh Mr. Jeff Schofield. You're so loud. It's unbelievable. Oh, oh my so God. My ears. Down a little Wait, bit. Hold on. Let me go see the doctor. Here we are. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. <laughs> We've been doing the pre the pre flask show. Oh, okay. um, yes. Uh, so the answer clearly is yes. The Canon 10 to 18 will still have dual pixel CMOS AF even on an adapter. Uh, get Canon's adapter for the M50, and it's a no problemo. Uh, it's bueno, not no bueno. I don't know if that means anything, but you get the idea. Uh, good. All right. So I think we've uh, gone through G7. Uh, I know Caleb uh, Grumpy Penguin is a fan of uh, for low cost camera. I think that in the end, if I'm looking for something for vlogging, I'm looking for great AF uh, and uh, hopefully not a 6300 rolling shutter, which is total ass. But we won't talk about that right now. I just did. But you know what I'm saying. And here he is. It's Caleb Pike. Uh, so let me uh, let me just give you guys a little official intro here. So Caleb, we've been doing this uh, pre-flash show. So when people are hanging out, uh, answering some general questions about production and things like that, I'm going to try to keep this going every week, especially when you're doing your live stream. Um, and I guess I'll do the intro this week because I'm. Uh, it's my turn, isn't it? It is. is it? Yeah. All right, so let's do that, and then we'll uh, get right into it. So, hey, everybody, Jem Schofield of the C47 here, and welcome to Camera and Flask episode number nine. We're going to get into double digits next week, so I'm excited. What I am not excited about, though I am also excited about it, is that our good friend Ben Barden, who is part of the Three Amigos, is not here this week. Um, as I've mentioned before, he's up in the North Pole. He is riding on the back of a narwhal, uh, probably drinking some whiskey in some form or another, actually probably a, a vodka, I would imagine, up there. And he's hanging out with Santa Claus and the elves and, uh, and all the Finnish people up there. And then he's going to go retire to a sauna at some point. But really, he's on an oil rig, and we will miss him, and we want him to come home safely for next week's episode with some stories from up north. Uh, what we have here, of course, is the other partner uh, in crime this week, and it is Caleb Pike. So, Caleb, go ahead and do your intro, and then uh, I want to find out what you're drinking this week. Oh, boy. Captain Four Roses in the house. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Caleb from DSLR Video Shooter. Um, yeah, YouTube video production stuff. And uh, I'm excited. Flying in here with my pants on fire. I apologize for being late. I had to log in to Google on Chrome and then they did the whole two form factor two oh, form, God. you know, that whole thing. So I'm like finding codes on my phone and the whole, <laughs> so that's what, that's what's up everybody. Thank you for being patient with me and uh, for joining us. Good times. Yeah. Good. So we've got some, uh, some regulars and we've got some regulars who have come back. One of our friends, uh, 360 grad has been hanging out in Japan for about a month. So he's back Ooh, and, okay. uh, and, uh, and, and some new faces, uh, some new people here to hang out for this weekly live stream where we talk about all things production related. Uh, we have always a topic for the week. But we like to veer away from that topic sometimes. And what makes this thing work is this community that is growing, that is chatting with each other and with us. And so we have time for everybody there. Caleb has got an Irish coffee. Yesterday, I did Irish coffees all day, man. I was feeling like a little something in the throat. And I said, am I, am I going to go down the like, Advil and all that kind of route, or am I just going to just say, let's just put some scotch in the cup? And I did, and I felt better. It was amazing. I mean, not a nice. lot. It was like a, it was like a s s slow sipping, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So what you got for uh, your drink today, Mr. Caleb? Besides all that right. Mug. Still, still haven't gone, gone out and, and picked up some good stuff for the show. So today it's going to be uh, just a Stella. Oh, Stella Trois. There we yep. go. Yeah. Boom. 
there we go. Belgium's answer to Budweiser. Not really. But it's I, kind of I, I would hope it's not. Let's, let's not make me look that bad. I would say it's leaps oh. and bounds better. No, it's, le it's leaps and bounds better, but it's probably their Budweiser, wouldn't you say? That's like, you know, true. Wow. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I didn't say it the right way. Just give me shit. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> How about you? What, what do you got there? So it's a little bit different today because uh, when we are done with today's show, I have to make a beeline to go meet some neighbors. We're actually meeting the neighbors over here. Okay. And I realize that this looks like uh, – I apologize, by the way. We've been shooting for almost an entire week tabletop and stand-ups for a four-part series, and I realized that I switched my – uh, frame rate on my camera and I'm pushing a lot to the monitor that's up there, but I am in, uh, in Canon log three glory here, which is why that it looks so flat. So I apologize. Maybe at some point when, uh, Caleb is blabbing, I'll just go over there and push that LUT because it's kind of driving me crazy, but it's okay. Gotcha. Um, well, I so look like I, butt over here with my, I like my it. lighting's all jacked up today. I like it. So I'm, we're going over to meet the neighbors, and we're going to go meet at a wine place. So I'm not going to start mm. drinking scotch right now. So I am having here. Well, where I got to remember where I put this. God damn it! I'm, I think I'm on face only. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. I always leave it on face <laughs> only, and so that's what's killing me. Um, a good B cam to the C200, Robin. I know I'm going to be a jerk about this. Is a C200 really? I mean, that is the best B cam, of course, and that's without saying. Um, that's a tough one uh, because, you know, at least from Canon, there aren't a lot of options. I do have a friend, John Romer, who has a great website, and John uses um, a 1DX Mark II, and he's been using the new EOS R uh, full-frame camera, and he's got that kind of dialed in, and I think he's going to be writing some articles. So the answer to this, by the way, is I am drinking a Lang, which is a Willamette Valley uh, Pinot Noir. So I'm having a little wine because if I'm going to drink, you know, beer or I'm going to drink uh, scotch right now, that's not going to mix very well when I go over and I drink wine with the neighbors. Okay. So there you go. So let's have a quick cheers. Uh, cheers. Good, sir. Cheers to everybody um, else. Uh, whatever you're drinking does not have to have alcohol in it. Um, we are obligated to drink alcohol on this show as the three hosts, but um, we made that decision and that is the bed that we lie in. Um, so here we, <laughs> why are you laughing? So <laughs> let me know if there is more echo. No, no, you're fine. You're, I, I think I had to turn my headphones down. I'm totally okay. fine. So we're good. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. So this week's episode is part one of our favorite, uh, grip equipment and grip gear. So, um, we want to start to do that. Um, and we are also getting just general questions about production which I love. I might as well just hit one right now before we jump into the other stuff. What are Do some it. red flags when purchasing a used C100? Uh, the seller mm. is the red flag. I mean, uh, and, and you know, it depends. If it's a Mark I, that mother's probably got hours and hours and hours on that thing. And, uh, you know, any thoughts on that, Caleb? That's why, you know, I, I kind of worry about a camera that's been on the market for about seven years. I was going to ask you that, like, what's what's the story with the hours? I've never known, like, all right, at hour, you know, it's, is there a timing belt in a C100 that goes out after a certain amount of time, you know? Um, I don't think there is. Um, I feel but, like with a C100, you're, you're probably, of all the used cameras, you're going to be the safest, right? Pretty much. I mean, you know, again, I would say that the seller is really the one that I'd be the most concerned about. Yeah. You know, have they dropped it? What's the deal with it? I have two C100 Mark 1s. We were using one of them this week in the production. You know, it's not hero footage. It's not going to be full screen footage. But I mean, those cameras still work. They work great. I have worked those two cameras more than any cameras I've ever owned. Um, they are workhorses and you don't have to think about them like DSLRs in terms of shutter count, you know, um, the same way, but you could always ask the, uh, seller what the hours are on the unit and get a sense of, um, how they use the camera for what types of things, ask them if they have a website, I want to get a sense if they're, you know, somebody who's in, in production, or are they more of a, you know, a dentist, you know, doctor, lawyer who just wanted to have uh, a camera? And that actually might be your best bet because it may have low usage. Um, yeah. Do you want to um, 
Oh, that's a great question. We should definitely address that. Uh, mm -hmm. Angels on acid. Uh, what do you carry your grip equipment in? I think that's a really solid question because that's a tough one, depending on what you're hauling. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that first? Do you have, uh, I mean, I have some things that I used, but uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we could do that. I, I just used uh, for like driving around type stuff, which is mostly what I did. We didn't fly too much. Um, just a big old like soft but hard case you know like those light stand cases you can get they roll around um cali met had a good one and we just threw all the stands and and you know grip heads and all that stuff in there uh c stands i just threw in the back of the car or van and uh that worked for me i know duffel bags also are solid um had one of those like massive ones i found on amazon but pelican yep. if we're flying yep uh, if I'm traveling locally, it's all about head crates. That's it. I've got eight of them, and each egg crate has different grip equipment in it. So I'll have clamps in one. I'll have, you know, or actually I have more than one egg crate for different types of clamps. And then I'll have other types of grip uh, and hardware-based equipment in those different crates. Because, you know, this stuff is is built for, you know, this is supposed to be banged around and beat up a little bit. So um, I'm not trying to dome key wrap every single one of my clamps. That's not the whole goal here. So um, so egg crates and then the same as uh, Caleb for the other stuff. Um, can we post links to the gear you use for your grip equipment as well? Yeah, we can. Um, you know, I've kind of, this is, it's funny you bring that up. I've kind of shied away a little bit from doing that for the live stream because even though it's on my channel, it's really a show um, with myself, Caleb, and Ben. So, um, you know, I've, I kind of made a decision that you can just go to my regular posts or to the C47 website or to DSLR Video Shooters website or to the YouTube channel. And uh, one of these days, Ben will actually get his act together and start posting as well. And you can find our recommendations in all of those things. So I'd love it if you, you know, if you smash the subscribe button and, you know, and that bell, get the bell going because there's some new things happening now. We have more people watching. So I'm starting to use that premiere feature when I post an episode where we watch the episode live together and then I can answer some questions for up to 15 minutes. And then also uh, we tried today the pre-flask show. So if you get notifications, then you'll know when this stuff is happening. But basically for me on this channel, everything's on Wednesday. Um, so yes, I can. But if you just go to our various properties, you will see links to recommended grip equipment and gear. And I try to, and Caleb tries to update that stuff on a pretty regular uh, basis. Um, we have any other questions here? Because I, I, I love, I, I have a few things here, but I just think, getting into these questions early on might be a good way to do this. And there's questions already related to grip and stuff like that. Okay. No, that's great. This is this stuff solid. So keep it up guys. Um, another one from part-time film soft versus hard cases. All right. What do you got? Caleb? You? What do you think? Oh, I just, um, I don't use hard cases as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, unless again, it's, if it's going to go in the bottom of a plane, you know, and it's going to get chucked around. Uh, like I have that that Pelican 1650, the overhead, you know, carry on, but it's just so heavy. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'll use that for random stuff, but I, I love Porter Brace. It's kind of my go-to for like soft, hard. They're really soft and they're lightweight, but you can stand on them and the walls won't fold in. Um, and I know you're a, a think tank. Wait, yeah. Right. No, I, I use a lot of Tenba stuff, but I like Think Tank stuff as well. Yep, both. Right on. Right. Um, yep. All that stuff is good. Everybody's making great stuff. Yeah, um, oh, that's true. Yep. So uh, actually, so Nicholas, uh, you're lighting small spaces all the time and you struggle with it. Do you have any tips? Um, both Caleb and I have a lot of content related to that kind of stuff. In fact, uh, Oddly enough, Caleb and I are lighting small spaces every single week for the content that we create for YouTube. 
So um, you'll find a lot of stuff. I mean, on my channel, Gearbox 2.0, there's a relatively recent episode. In fact, there's only about 16 episodes of the new reboot where I go into shooting uh, and lighting a small space. And I'll be doing more of those in the future for sure. Uh, and Caleb has a lot of content as well where he breaks down and shows you exploded views of his small space and then the lights and modifiers that he's using for that. So I would say that's a good place to start. And, um, you know, you're on the right platform here on YouTube. You did dig a little bit. But um, when you take a look at a channel like Caleb's DSLR Video Shooter and you see the suggestions, you'll also find other creators and a lot of content that's similar to that uh, that might be a good place to start. Uh, Caleb, any recommendations on that? Yeah, that's the, we both. Uh, you just recently did one about shooting in a hotel room. Yep. Um, and uh, all that stuff's really solid. I would ask what what kind of ceiling space you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I mean, and also sensor size makes a huge difference. It's amazing going from just Super 35 to full frame, what you're able to pull off. Um, but more and more I'm finding, because my space sucks. The ceilings are super low. So I have to sit on a super short stool. It's, it's comical. Like my knees are like, my thighs are going up. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, side keying, which I know Jem's a big fan of, uh, mm -hmm. helps a lot. So mm -hmm. instead of trying to get that light up and over, you know, at a 45, drop it down and move it to the side and then just bring in some fill and that can do wonders. Um, keep talking. I'm going to go, I'm going to go switch my light. Okay, cool. Frank, keep going. Um, another thing to do is just try to find a, a fast, uh, wide lens. And, uh, that can help a lot because your light is able to get closer to yourself if you're near if, if you're filming near the camera for instance this is a 28 millimeter on this sony a6500 and I, I can put my you know this hand is really really close so you can get your light source closer to your subject if they're within a reasonable distance from the lens obviously that's not going to work for for all framing and then if you're in a really cramped spot what we used to do a lot was um you can't really get a nice wide for your interview. So you just have to do that kind of medium tight. And then uh, what we would do is, is get footage of the person's hands folded, um, things like that. Do a, a more extreme angle uh, for just some B-roll. Maybe you're setting up or you're filming and the, the interviewee is, is chatting with uh, the interviewer, you know, get to a spot where you can't see their mouth and you get a couple shots, you know, that's kind of stuff you can cut in to mix it up because it sometimes you just have that one, you know, hero interview shot and that's what you're stuck with. So yep. it's tough. It's tough. Uh, we got Baron asking for, I'm looking for some super good cheap C stands, any recommendations and Matthew Roper answering with the answer that I would give, which is basically just go with Matthews. I'll add Avengers to that as well. Avenger uh, C stands are one, if not the fundamental parts of the grip department. Don't skimp on them. You don't skimp on them. They're um, they're not going to be that much more expensive to buy a better quality C stand, uh, and you might as well just go with the big boys again. Matthews Avenger uh, Kupo's making decent stuff now, um, but I would say I would still lean towards those other two brands personally. And uh, you just, again, it's like, it's like at a certain point with tripod systems, you realize that all you're doing is investing in something that at a certain point has planned obsolescence and uh, it's going to go bad at a certain point. So uh, C-stands by the right companies are not going to go bad generally. Um, you know, I've maybe had one, I've had one go bad on me in forever. So that's a pretty good track record and i've got a lot of c stands around here so um yeah there you go um you know i'm sure that one that you bought for 100 bucks from adorama is fine um but i would say you know in the future just keep investing in in decent quality across the board so you can buy you know you can buy cheap other things but that wouldn't be where i would skimp on um i would throw in that the impact stands are pretty solid I have a bunch of those turtle base impact C stands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, really happy with them. Um, 
And the nice thing about C stands is even if you buy some cheap ones, <laughs> I wouldn't buy the cheapest. Like I did buy just for kicks. I bought an $80 C stand off of Amazon. Yeah. It was amazingly terrible. It was incredible. But uh, and then you, you always spend, need more. Yeah. Always need more. Okay, always. good. Um, okay, so it's, wow, man. We're really good stuff. How about this one? Black Film Guild. This is a great question. When you light, how often do you use the light in the room versus turn off all the lights and just light the place yourself? For example, uh, how are you respective? What? How are you okay. respective light light? How are you respective? Oh, okay, gotta gotta, gotta, gotta. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Okay. Uh, I would say for our like YouTube stuff, we pretty much shut it all down and and build our own setups. But neither of us probably have well lit to begin with, right? Like you're in a in a kind of interior area in your barn, right? Totally. And yeah. I'm in the basement. I mean, yeah. This is all lit. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, but I'm. But yeah. Go ahead. Well, I would say I would I love lighting when there's existing lighting, especially with these LED fixtures that get crazy bright. I mean, you can easily fight window, you know, keep up with window light these days. If you have like a 120D, a 300D, something like that, or something from uh, Aerie. Um, so I, I love it just because it gives you a really nice um, overall fill kind of the, the room just has this nice kind of soft light often if you have larger windows it's bouncing all over the place and then with your key you can kind of you know add some character there or shape things a little bit there is some negative fill so i love doing that but you know it's also nice to if you have enough time that's a real kicker is time in fixtures to build your own setup from scratch and then there's other things like color temperatures do the lights in the space suck like LEDs these days are pretty terrible. There's a lot of bad stuff people are putting in their lamps and stuff. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, totally. Um, you know, a lot of it is dictated by the type of shoot that you're doing, of course. So, um, you know, if you're shooting multiple interviews over a longer period of time, then working with existing ambient light can be tricky because you're gonna see lots of change in light levels. So that's where you start to make very quick decisions about whether or not you're going to completely control that environment or you're going to work with the ambience or the practicals that are in that environment. Um, you know, sometimes you can recreate that as well. Sometimes in hotel rooms, what we'll do is we'll take a like a one by one panel and we'll basically turn all of the lights off, but we will push that light into the ceiling and just create overall ambience. And then what you can do is you can open a little bit of a window just somewhere there's a little bit of a, a window open and you just feel there's window light coming in but you have the shears closed and just a little bit and so what you're doing is you're giving the impression that you're using natural light but you're not necessarily using that light very much um, so it just depends on the situation and what you're doing uh, harrison asked the question do i still like the triad orbit stand system and uh, if you haven't seen that there's an episode on my channel about it I call it the C-stand alternative. Um, I do like it for certain applications. Um, I, I would like them to redesign how you tighten uh, and loosen the actual column components of the stand, but it is a weighted, very small, compact uh, stand that is great for um, especially traveling because if you can't source C-stands for some reason, you still need to have pretty heavy duty stands for some of your fixtures. Um, I use them and I still use them. Um, they're not, of course, if I have a C stand around going to replace a C stand, but they are an alternative and they do work well. And when I need to travel small, um, then the triad orbit stands do make a lot of sense. And I love their IO in out system, which uh, has this hex like quick release where you can basically have a, a baby pin on there. You can have a 3 8 16, you can have a quarter 20, and you can adapt it in different ways, and they have different boom arms and stuff. Um, I think they kind of need to go one more step to make that whole system really work um, universally for our industry, as opposed to just um, initially where they were focused, which was more in the music industry. So this is you know something that was more in uh, big, large recording studios, which of course has a lot of equipment happening as well. Um, so there you go. 
God damn, I love this grumpy penguin. Uh, that is just the best. Okay, so um, what do we got? Man, it's like everybody, away, dude. everybody is just going. I love this. Uh, no, you're you're up now. I just talked. Uh, what well, else I feel like you would have a lot to add on this one. Essentially, Grumpy's asking, uh, what would your recommendation be for a single person interview outdoors? Set up in the shade if possible, then add fill. Uh, I the shade is a quick, quick way to get that done. The only issue is uh, finding a, a dark background because that yep. always looks bad, right? When you have beautiful shade, nice soft light, and then it, everything's just you know yellow yeah. and white in the background. Mm -hmm. So you've been playing with all these nets. Everyone should check out Jim. Jim, you did a video recently where you yep. were outside yep. and you used a net in the background. Mm -hmm. um to knock that down um otherwise just just stand out in the sun and uh, have a big old honking something of diffusion right yeah i mean the, the toughest part is really how small is your crew because if you can get your crew up to three people and you're doing the exterior shoot that changes the whole game because you can set up a couple of c stands and you can put dirt on them um i.e sandbags and you can also have people spotting those stands. So if you've got a six by six or an eight by eight, or you know even just a four by four that's diffusing the sunlight, um, you know if a gust of wind comes along, you're not going to basically hurt anybody, uh, namely talent. And that is always a consideration: safety first. You know, um, the number one most important thing in production, besides audio, maybe more important than audio, is uh, safety. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of our talent, that we're taking care of our crew, and that everybody is doing this in a proper and safe manner. And it's easy to forget that because you get caught up into the creative and into the time crunch and into making your day. But ultimately, when we're using these tools, they are, um, these are heavy fuckers, you know? I mean, they are, you know, they, one of these hits somebody in the head and, uh, you know, it's going to do real damage and you can send somebody to the hospital quite easily, especially in exterior locations. So it really is about that whole, you know, righty tighty, lefty loosey, bagging all of your stands, um, making sure you're using the appropriate amount of grip equipment for what you are setting up. Um, we've all been there where we've made those mistakes and we could, you know, and those close calls, hopefully you haven't had uh, more than a close call. And it really reminds you that it's uh, definitely something that has to be thought about in, uh, you know, in, in real serious, uh, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Go ahead, Caleb. You talk about that. I just got to go grab something real quick. Go ahead. No problem. Um, yeah. So diffusion, if you could do it safely, obviously. Um, another method is, I don't know what kind of lights you have, but if you're doing this regularly, it might be worth looking into something like a 300D with like a soft box uh you could have the sun or the brightest direction of the outdoor scenario you're in as kind of a backlight or uh from one side and behind the person and then hit the other side with that 300d what's nice about the 300d is for what 1100 bucks you get the light fixture and then uh, I recently found those uh, DNO lighting V mount batteries. Uh, they're 190 watt hour batteries. Two of those gives you 75 minutes of full output 300D. So, and they're not, they're very affordable batteries. Um, so you're not putting out ridiculous coin on those. So for around, I would 1300 bucks or less, uh, you're looking at 75 minutes of keeping up with very, very bright situations with a 300D. So that could be a, a quick and easy uh, way to do that. But that's a lot of light. <laughs> so yeah, outdoor, outdoor. Um, what other questions did I just see here? People are talking about camera movement and getting smooth shots. Um, all right, slider question. When shooting, this is from part-time films. When shooting sliding what is a good frames per second in shutter speed i'm getting choppy look want smooth shots like kalo's b-roll not sure if you saw that from earlier got it um i don't use a slider almost for that reason uh for two reasons one the setup time to do it right is just 
takes forever. You got to get everything out, set it all up and to move it all to get a good shot. And you just need weight. And, and depending on how much you spent on that slider, um, you're going to need more weight. Yep. And I'm, I'm, I just suck at like, I'm really good with like hand eye coordination, you know, play video games, love that stuff. But when it comes to using like a slider, I just can't manually without a ton of weight or a huge, you know, counterbalance flywheel. I just can't quite get it done. So uh, I just use tripods almost every shot in my B roll. If it's moving, it's a tripod pan. That's all it is. And we often use like a $80 tripod head. You know, I've been talking to Jim off stream about tripods because uh, I eventually want to finally for the first time in, you know, 12 years buy a, a big boy tripod. Mm -hmm. So I've been using cheap ones and uh, usually they're OK when you when if you have one with a heavy drag, you know, uh, so that's all I do. Um, but Caleb, you did have a recent episode where, and I think that this, is, I also don't break out sliders very often. I just find that the setup time and get the move, it's not that I, I can't use a slider, but if I'm going to go that route and it's not going to be motorized, I'm going to tend to lean more towards something like a Dana dolly um, and use something like that. But then you really want to have a little bit of weight, as you said, um, to create that inertia. And, you know, it does take, it does take practice to get that consistent. And sometimes it might be better for you to take a look at using a gimbal based system and just getting that move if you can, especially with the advancements that we're seeing now with tracking capabilities with the gimbals where you can set up a shot and you can basically have it track an object parallax style or whatever you're gonna do. Um, but there was a slider that you just had on recently. Is that the shark or something like that? Um, yeah, the uh, the shark mini motorized and it's great, but you can't put too much weight on it. No, you uh, you're talking for really smooth stuff, like perfectly smooth. And that's the problem is slow and smooth. Yep. Really hard to do with those motors. So it's like an a 6500. Yep. If you want like a GH5, you know, you got to speed it up or something. So yeah. And then, and then you're moving into some of the solutions like the second shooter from uh, Kessler and stuff like that. And then you've got to think about your track and then you're going to go with their cine sliders or you're going to go with, you know, a, a different motorized solution from a company like them. Um, it's an investment and it's lots of cabling and it's, you know, are your batteries all charged and there's a lot of components there. So when you're in a, a medium to larger size production, then getting into dollies makes a lot of sense. But in a lot of those situations, they're setting up track and they are, you know, pushing a Fisher dolly and, and or doorway dolly or whatever they're going to be doing. And they're usually going to have a dolly grip in that situation anyway. So um, it's a tough space to, you know, to be getting really good uh, stuff. And and really those really uh, good quality fluid heads, the big difference is when you are. Um, in situations where you are following movement within the space or, you know, uh, things like that, when you really have to anticipate movement. For a lot of the stuff that we're doing in the studio, it doesn't really matter. You know, we can set up with heavy drag for a, a quick shot here or there, as Caleb said. Um, and the reason that you need more weight is it kind of to reduce the wobble. There's an inertia when you're using a slider or a dolly that when you have a heavier camera system, and it, it's a two-parter. It's not just the slider or the dolly system. It's also the fluid head. It's a combination of those two. But when you have too little weight, it tends to move too quickly. And so it's hard for you to control it. It's very similar to the idea of using a mirrorless or a DSLR camera. And once you get that onto a bigger rig, um, you know, it's a more stable thing. You can also create more points of contact as opposed to just trying to hold it with your hand. Um, obviously, image stabilization helps a lot with that in terms of cameras. But, uh, you know, it's just some, some physics and some things that happen in the real world that we can't necessarily get away from, uh, at least not completely yet. Yeah. Uh, Welcome, yeah. Chris. How are you doing? This evening, um, I have you, Jim, heard about the Rhino Arc Two that was just announced on Kickstarter? No, and you know that's funny that you mentioned that. I was going to say Rhino along with the Kessler stuff. Um, mm. 
their system is a system I've wanted to try for a while. And I know that the previous system has very mixed reviews. Um, so I haven't seen that. And I'm definitely going to uh, check that out because I am looking for something that could handle sort of these small digital cinema cameras. There yeah, are you some. Check it out. Yeah. Because there's some things that I want to do to add a little bit of production value to certain things that I'm doing, and I, I would like to see what that is. That'd be great. Yeah, it's like up to 14 or 17 pounds. Yeah. Motorized head. It's so I pre-ordered just the head part because oh, you did throwing that on throw it just to throw it on sticks and get pan and tilt perfectly yeah. smooth and animate it. And there's a, there's a little 50 mil rod with a little motor for your lens. Oh, for YouTube, that's just going to be gold just to you know, have an assistant on an iPhone, tap, tap, yep. tap. Yep. Can you, hopefully, uh, can hopefully you, it doesn't suck. <laughs> can you pop, a, can you pop a link into that? So we can, oh, sure. take yeah, I'll hunt her down. That'd be awesome. Good, good, good. Uh, I forgot to switch over to you there. Sorry, Caleb. I sometimes That's forget. Fine. Caleb and I have been talking about a different system at a certain point than this hangouts. Cause I physically have to go over there and click on our little icons or thumbnails here. Um, yeah, the uh, the Edelkrone, Edelkrone stuff is pretty interesting. Uh, I've been playing around a little bit with their multi-part series and yeah, you know, and, and putting those pieces together. I have it in the other room over there. Um, it's it's actually pretty cool, but it's um, just the new thing. No, no, it's not brand new. It's the uh, the little slider one, and uh, you know their motor system. God, I've gone blank right now. Uh, Rhino Arc Two, okay. Uh, but, you know, those guys are really good industrial designers. I think they sort of hit or miss. Sometimes it's like the total winner of a product. And then other times you're drooling when you watch the video. But then when you try the stuff, it's not necessarily a practical everyday thing. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look for kit at this point that I can use all of the time. Right. So mm. I want to have stuff that's like day in, day out. Like I have, you know, uh, clamp clamp different sizes right so we're talking about and they have different applications because when i'm trying to get something off of a c stand further out like a four by four frame this longer end jaw cardellini clamp is going to be better than maybe this short one right here i'm partial to end jaw obviously center jaw might be good for certain types of things um you know i'm actually looking at getting a second one of these you cannot have too many quacker clamps because when when I'm normally holding what is over here, which is a four foot by four foot piece of basically bounce, I'm using one of these. And, um, you know, they're not cheap, but they're not really expensive if you're using it every single day. And, um, you know, I, we talked about this in the pregame show, the pre-flask show. I have talked about these many times and there's an episode on these and it's the mini grip head and the mini Mathalini clamps, you know, and what you can do with these from Matthews. And it's that type of kit. Um, we were talking about storing stuff in crates. I have an entire crate with A-clamps. You know, it sounds ridiculous. I hate that these stupid things come off all the time. The rubber bits, we all do. Uh, you know, maybe one day somebody will design one that they don't ever come off. They always at some point come off from what I've seen. Uh, you try to epoxy? No, but some, I, I'm some not. old audio guy showed me that trick. Well, maybe I'll do that. If you have an afternoon and are ready for some fumes, go for it. <laughs> All right, good. That sounds good. Um, you know, and then there's other stuff. Uh, I've talked about this in the past as well. The, this is part one, so we're not talking about everything. But I build a lot of these little things out of, um, you know, these studs with nano clamps and ball heads and i have all these little adapters here so this is a baby pin this is a quarter 20 female to a baby pin so i can stick that onto a ball head here and then this will basically clamp to any small thing back of a chair a table whatever it is and once it's clamped down i have a ball head on here and i can just loosen that and then i have the ability to move that wherever i want you know, so it's having, for me, it's having equipment that I can use all of the time, 
that I'm really trying to move towards. You and I have more stuff in our studios than we should, but it's part of the nature of what we do. Um, but when it comes down to real production, it's really, uh, you know, it's really about finding the stuff that I keep going. In fact, we just did a huge clean out, Ken and I, here in the, in the barn, where we basically got virtually everything that I never use got out of here. And so we're wow. only organizing the stuff that we would go to on a regular basis. We're not totally done, but it's, uh, it's really good. Uh, Plasti dip. That sounds like it would hurt, but I'm going to find that. And I'm going to, on my clamps, do you mean clamps or do you mean clamps? That's what I want to know about that. Okay, I'll check that out. I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, Caleb, uh, let's bring in some, you can put gaffer tape around the rubber thing and the clamp. They won't come off anymore. That's true. I could. Gaff tape's expensive, but, you know, probably Plasti Dip is pretty expensive, too. I don't know. Have you used Plasti Dip? Yeah, it's been a long time. Isn't that just like a, you're essentially coating the ends, right? Oh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, just a little bit of epoxy, you know, just a two-part. Oh, it's like, oh, no, it it's just, uh, Plasti Dip is like spray on rubber. Right. Heck, yeah. All right, I'll try that. Mm. Uh, Home Depot or Lowe's? Oh, Old Wave 1. Uh, last week, I said I didn't like the Canon 17-40. to 40. Why? It sucks. <laughs> it doesn't, I have it. It's, you know it why? Have, I, not, not, no magic, right? It just doesn't have that, like... Yeah, it's like, you know, uh, Ben was talking about the 16-35, to 35, right? I'm switching back to you, but I'm, I'm going to be a little, a little gem right now because I don't want to feel so big, big-headed. Um, the, the 16 to 35 is like, it's a great lens. And then you put that 17 to 40 on, you're like, meh, that's M E H by the way. Um, so it's just, it's kind of soft and it's kind of blah. It's like comparing the 24 to 70 version one that I have on here to the version two. And yes, it is soft. Uh, and don't use Plasti dip on your 17 to 40. Okay. There we go. I don't know what that means either. Okay, Caleb, <laughs> where's your audio? Are you there? Not bad. I had Hello? it muted. Oh, uh, yeah. I've, okay. I've got a dog being a real turd. That's okay. But head up there and then 3D print yeah. in the background. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So do you want to go over some stuff real quick while we have a quick lull here in the old chat? Actually, no. Well, you already kind of went through some stuff, right? I went through some stuff. Uh, I think it's your turn. And then we're, and we're, almost, we're almost quarter two on the hour. And today, unfortunately, mm. uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it would be good if we had a little balance here, by the way, in the ladies and gentlemen department, you know, but whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, you know, but there you go. Any of you 54 to... people out there, not a dude, <laughs> let us know. Because. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'd like to have a shout out. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious. The uh, interweb. Okay, yeah, Caleb. I, you, you covered the same stuff I was pretty much going to cover, what I grabbed. Yeah. Well, I, should, is there anything else that you have there? Anything? There's one thing there? I want that I don't have, and I can't remember the name, but it's essentially a, a baby pin Iris. in the center. Yes, Iris. Shout hey, out to Iris. Iris. Not All a right. dude. Hell yeah. All right. Awesome. There's Thank one. For, okay. One in 54. Okay. All right, good. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, wife's please. watching. Yep. But shout out, please. Uh, we need a balance here. Uh, this is uh, good for the industry. Thank goodness. Uh, that actually could be a great topic. I, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm on a soapbox, but I do, uh, I do as a producer try to hire, uh, you know, a balance here. You know, it's not fun showing up at a, a set that represents half of the human race. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Okay, so go. <laughs> what do what do you uh, what do you what do you want, Caleb? I, I'm gonna pull it up or try to find an image of it. But essentially, it's a baby pin with two grip heads. So the idea is you can fly two arms. Like you could fly a silk and uh, a, yep, yep, a, a okay. muslin, and then a light in the middle. Bounce, you know, a little book book light on stand, one stand or something like that. You know what that's called? I don't know. I might have one in the crate. Uh, yeah, it looks like like two grip heads got weird. 
Um, let me find it. I'm gonna find it here. Uh, There's so many things that are coming to mind, but I it's so inappropriate. Also, uh, 20, 20 inch grip arms. I can never get enough. I have one. I only have one because one, one? of my. No, no, I have I have two. I think I have two. Maybe I have one. Yeah, I I love the twenty inch grip arms. They're so little. They're like nano grip, uh, nano uh, grip arms. Hollywoods, you mean, right? For they're amazing. For, for stands, the twenties. Well, yeah. I just always want one more. Mm. I've got like five, and they're all they're all in play. All right, here's the thing. I'm gonna drop a link. Maybe I'll screen share. Do nah, that's risky. It's always risky. Um, maybe I can cover up my screen with this. Hang on a second. I'm going to screen share this really, really, really quick. <laughs> All right. Please don't fail me. Um, balls. Here we go. Screen share. All right. You're going to see Jem's lovely face for a second. All right. How are we doing? You see it? Yeah. Oh, I've seen that. This thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. I want it. That is great. What would be even better if there was a little articulating arm that came off of both of those sides from where the baby pin is so that you, you could almost have two adjustable grip heads off of that baby pin. So you can well, get I think that's more. what it is. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a center. Uh, can I zoom in anymore? I don't think I can. There's a okay. center knuckle or knob to tighten it yep. to the stand. Yeah. And then on either side is a grip head. And you've got a baby pin coming off the top. Right. So it's receiver, yeah. or male and female. But you can't ang grips. you can't angle the two grip heads like on a, a a thirty degree angle or something, is what I was saying. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I mean? I don't know. Okay, I've never I tried. Mean, you, can, you can rotate them, of course, to right. get different right. angles. Right. Right. You can't you can't uh, necessarily turn them in or out. Um, but that is awesome. Okay, cool. I yeah, I have some interesting stuff for uh, for for episode two. So. Um, yeah, there you go. We've got all the part um, ones out there. And Baron, we are inappropriate just because we are Cameron Flask. It has nothing to do with who shows up. We are who we are, and we embrace that. So uh, we just go with it. So there you go. It is not. Uh, it is not a. It's not a guy show here. We happen to be dudes, but this is about production and the industry and what we do, and we. We just want to talk about kit and what we're doing. Anybody who's been on the set knows the deal, right? We've got our lines and we know where they are and they should be there in terms of what we do and don't say. But we're also in this to enjoy ourselves and have a good time and not take ourselves too seriously, except for when we say action and the job has to get done. Okay, so uh, that's all I got to say to that. You can hate me for... For that if you want and i'm here i'm like an open book okay uh caleb what do you got talk to me wait looks like a spaceship from star wars yeah it kind of does um there's all good. kinds of stuff you do you ever go to b and h and just like troll yeah. around the grip category yeah. and the use department i have to say that uh i would say that besides lighting that grip equipment is probably the thing that i am most enamored by uh, it's, it's the whole, let me solve this problem. Let me have something. I love it when I am on a set or I'm trying to figure something out and they go into this little bag of tricks and I pull this stuff out and it like, it solves the exact problem that we need to solve. Uh, nothing feels better. It is nothing. Um, the other day I was on a gig where we, they, they didn't have another tripod and they needed one. So mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out how to do it. Uh, I was being like interviewed. And so yep. I had my little bag of stuff I was showing for the video. So I took a, 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 a tripod plate, mounted a ball head I had to it, and then used an extra C stand they had and clamp, used the end of the grip head to clamp onto that and then add the camera to that. So they had a ball essentially on the end of a C stand. Did you post that to shitty rigs? I should have. <laughs> it was oh pretty great. Was, oh, that should have been on shitty rigs. For but sure. nothing feels better when you set back and like you you solve the problem. And oh, it's I know. Like secure and it's like staying staying upright. That feels good. It does. Have you ever used a C stand 
like uh, through a cardellini clamp and used it because the end of the c stand is a counterweight through a cardellini it's like a c stand on the c stand so basically you've got a c stand but then you're doing the other c stand this way with the legs drooping oh, down oh right becomes, and that becomes your counterweight right so yeah, yeah this is a c stand and then this is also a c stand and then uh this is the legs of the c stand and then the end has the baby pin on it and you can basically just adjust it but it's got a built-in counterweight because of the the legs on there it's a shitty rig but i've done it before <laughs> it works awesome. <laughs> that's another thing i want is a uh uh what is it called it's like, like a hardcore c-stand like super strong m something yeah Ma um crap i can't remember what it's called but it's a mon like handles a ton of weight yeah so i heard 35 pounds it is it on what? a regular c-stand yeah I mean, you can obviously do more but yeah of that's course what... but center of gravity and all that stuff yeah. but yeah yeah uh guys buying the thing uh black friday uh you know i was so in the hole and uh waiting for client payments that i just drooled a little bit and i uh kept that card in my wallet i've got three count them three children people and there's this little holiday called christmas coming up so uh guess what guess what daddy jen gets for black friday zilch zilch i didn't buy uh, anything either if it makes you feel any better. Uh, it doesn't make me feel any better, uh, but I hope it makes <laughs> somebody else feel better. But there you go. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Okay, so we got to wrap this thing up for this week. I feel like this has been, uh, as was last week, a very, very interactive uh, episode of Cameron Flask. Um, I think we need people to tell other people about the live stream and invite your friends um we're going to come up with another topic for next week uh iris bought two lenses oh nice on cyber monday timing skills very good um yeah so uh it was a good i i think it was a good episode as well caleb what do you think my man yeah absolutely no i love yeah. these uh maybe we just do a i don't know one of let's these where we just kind of another another Q &A yeah. it up cheap ass reviews got some of your costs for the pros i you know I, yeah. think, I think i'm gonna buy i do have a second pair but i can't find them so i'm buying another pair when i got a, a few more ducats in the bank account uh because if these ever go out i cannot be without them i gotta buy another pair of my pennies as well but uh yeah good nle's one topic yeah we can talk about nonlinear editing systems uh, <laughs> uh yeah no actually when ben's on the show that's a good balance i think that'll be good yeah um so caleb you want to take us out for the week and uh tell everybody what to do and all that good stuff yeah, well, the first thing everyone should do is before leaving, make sure you subscribe to this here channel so we can see all your beautiful, beautiful icons next week. Because uh, every single Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern, we're here with something, and we're talking about something. And Gems, Gems always got something, something up his sleeve. So, uh, mm. hey, all of you who showed up, thank you guys so much. The chat what really was phenomenal. And... All you regulars, you know who you are. You're smiling right now. You know exactly who you are. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, that's about it, really. I'm over at DSLR Video Shooter. Jim Schofield's right here making wonderful content. And uh, hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And see you next week. And take care. <laughs>